Okay, so welcome to MathStat 341 Probability. I am Professor Miller. I've lost track of how many times I've taught this class. This is one of my favorite classes to teach at Williams. Uh, you may notice that the date is a little bit wrong. You know, the introductory lecture does not change too much, so I'm just using slides from before. Um, and what I want to do today is just give you a broad overview of what the class is going to be like. We have a lot of opportunities in terms of how we want to image the class. You know, I have all the lectures from previous years recorded. You know, we have the textbook and whatnot. So we are allowed to change if we want to a little bit how we do things. And so what I want to get from you, and you know, it doesn't have to be today, is how do you want to use class time? What is the most effective way to use class time? If there are things that you are very interested in pursuing, I am happy to work that into the curriculum. All right. So as always in the first class, you always have the mandatory you know, introduction and objectives. So not surprisingly, a big part of this class is going to be learning how to calculate probabilities. So we want to model the real world, and we want to try to determine the likelihood of events. Depending on your assumptions on your model, you can get extremely different answers. So one of my students works at a think tank, and he has written papers where if you change some of these parameters in these models by extremely small amounts, you have wildly different predictions. And you have to be extremely careful about that. This is, I think, one of the most important classes you can take in college. The other ones I would say is a stats class and a computer science class. I used to tell my students that if you took these three and did well, you would always have a job. I cannot do this anymore because a few years ago, someone graduated from another institution, did not have a job and sued her school. Now, what's great is because of the Freedom of Information Act, you can actually download the lawsuit where she misspells words like tuition. And she has found a new type of discrimination, which people had not noticed before, academic discrimination. The school did more for people with higher GPAs than lower GPAs. This was actually her lawsuit. So I cannot promise that you will have a job. I can say that to date, none of my students who have had these materials have failed to get a good job. And in fact, later today, I will send you an email from one of them who I think he will proudly say he was a D student in probability. You know, he really struggled, but he really wanted to learn the subject. And when he had one of the interviews, he nailed the $100,000 question. And so these are skills that will be used. I will probably comment about this later. Uh, any seniors here? Oh, okay, excellent. Uh, for, when you're a senior, you often have a fifth class, which is the job interviews, because you'll be either traveling a lot if things go back to normal, or at least having a lot of Zooms. If people want to do practice interviews, I'm happy to do practice interviews with you so that you have some preparation before you actually have it when it really counts and just give you some general advice. So again, we're gonna learn probability. I wanna emphasize the techniques and I wanna emphasize how important it is to ask the right question. So much of what I do is trained one people is that once you have a certain skill set, if you are told what to compute, it's pretty straightforward to compute it. The real challenge sometimes is figuring out what is worth computing. And so at some point in the near future, uh, in a couple of years, I want to team teach this class with a colleague of mine who is a stats professor at a business liberal arts school in the Boston area. And he and I both are very interested in the mathematics of sports, especially baseball, because baseball just has so much data. You know, it's wonderful to analyze. And so there's going to be a lot of opportunities in this class to try to write a research paper. And so I'm happy to reorder things so that you know, the exams count a little bit less and that paper or project counts a bit more. I think you learn a lot more from working on projects. So we'll try to model problems and we'll try to analyze the models. Frequently, the problems will be so complex that if you write down a model that incorporates everything, there's no way in hell you're going to be able to solve it. So you have to try to decide what are the key features and what's going to give you a good enough answer. Uh, sometimes you will have elegant solutions. Sometimes you have to do things by brute force. Anybody an econ major here? Okay, so for economics, you know, it's often extremely weird to have a closed form solution for what you should do. You often do a lot of Monte Carlo experiments and you say, well, if I vary this parameter and I randomize things and I just run a billion tries, if you're good or a thousand, if you're not so good, you know, what does it look like is happening? It's wonderful when you have closed form expressions and you can see, hey, if I change the tax rate by 5%, what does that do to the GDP? So when possible, we will try to come up with closed form models. Uh, any baseball fans here? All right, so there's a lot of statistics that I will be talking about from baseball. You don't need to know too much about the game. 
But uh, a lot of times we have beautiful closed form expressions. I will talk at some point about things like the log five rule or the Pythagorean one loss formula that allows you to make really good simple predictions on just a small amount of data. And even if it's not perfect, if you can get a ballpark estimate quickly, that's wonderful. All right, so there's a whole slew of problems you can study. You know, I've, I've just put a bunch over here. Um, I know we have a couple of students in, who have interest in gambling. I have some students who enjoy going to casinos and doing various legal things. But if you are caught doing some of these legal things, you might have to have a conversation with people. And it's such an important conversation. They want to make sure you're not interrupted by anybody. So they go to a very nice, quiet room. So you have to be a little bit careful sometimes in applying probability. And I am happy to talk about that when it is not being recorded. I, I have a degree in mathematics, which means I can basically do whatever the hell I want. I have written papers in accounting, economics, marketing, statistics, sabermetrics, physics, geophysics, computer science, economics. Because I have the quant skills, you just tell me what the variables are. Now, an economist will have a better understanding of how the things fit together. But a lot of times you can interpret what you're doing and rephrase it and cast it into, I know how to attack problems like this. And so one of my favorite quotes is, if all you have is a hammer, pretty soon every problem looks like a nail. There's a couple of ways to interpret this. One is whatever you're given, you try to find a way to recast it so that it looks like a nail because you know how to hit a nail. Has anybody ever watched a presidential debate? So you have two minutes to speak. It doesn't matter what question they ask you. After about 30 seconds, the candidate moves to whatever they wanted to talk about. And depending on how good they are, they meander better for those first 30 seconds as they start to move to their set piece that they were gonna work in no matter what. Yeah. This is the hammer and the nail. I know how to do this. I'm going to talk about this. There's another way to look at this quote. Go to the land of the screwdriver. There are smart people there. If they could have solved the problem using a screwdriver, they would have. There's a reason it's still open. Their skill set is not appropriate. So by taking your mastery in one field and moving it to another, you're competing with a different set of people with different set of skills. You don't want to be competing in, math with, in, in mathematics with Gauss. Okay? If you're competing with Gauss, unless you're using modern machinery, I'm going to vote on Gauss. My freshman year, my math study group had a discussion. I don't know how we got onto this. Who would we rather have, Miller or Euler? And they voted for Euler, and I reminded them that Euler is dead. They go, yeah, but we think it would be really inspiring to have Euler's body here. <laughs> but if you're going against Euler or Gauss just using what they do, it's going to be very tough to do better than they are. Now, if you use more modern machinery, new fields, that's different. But you've got to be very cognizant of what are you bringing to the problem. And if you're using the same techniques as everyone else, it's really hard to expect that you're going to have that breakthrough. It might happen. The greater likelihood is if you take these methods and apply them in a new area. All right, so some of my applied experiences, I've actually worked on a lot of marketing projects. One of my favorite is helping a movie theater decide which movies they want to show. And actually, I, when I teach operations research, we go into the real nuts and bolts of something like this. I've done a lot of data integrity with the Internal Revenue Service and other organizations on detecting fraud in either taxes or images or election data. And I've done a tremendous amount in sabermetrics in applying mathematics to baseball and trying to analyze various things. All right, so course mechanics, and these are subject to change. We are going to move at a fast pace. Um, I like to have my classes move fast at the beginning of the semester and ease up at the end of the semester because some of my colleagues don't quite understand that the number of weeks in the semester doesn't change, it's constant, and that they should make sure that they get all the work spaced evenly, and some classes have this real compression when they realize, oh my God, we've still got three more books to read. So my plan is to work you hard in the beginning of the semester so that when we get towards the end of the semester, we can slack off a little bit. Uh, so that hopefully your other classes will be on the opposite phase. So 5%, um, you're, you're responsible for reading the material before the class. I will assume everyone comes to class prepared. Homework is 15%. Uh, midterms will be 40%. I think there'll probably be two and I'll drop the lowest one unless you tell me otherwise. Uh, I can't understand why you would not, but I will drop the lowest unless you tell me otherwise. The final exam is 40%. You can do a project for 10% of your grade. If you want to negotiate with me for it to count for more, happy to have that negotiation. 
And there's a lot of really good things you can do, you know, trying to apply probability. And the goal is to just find something you're passionate about. So the prereqs are calc three and linear algebra. That's really more for mathematical maturity than for the actual material that we'll be using. We'll use some of it, but most of the calc three we'll be using is just doing, you know, calc two twice. So what is calc two typically? What do you typically do in calc two? You integrate. And so calc two is the class where I think we lie to you most when you leave. You, when you leave, you think you know how to integrate. You don't. I don't know how to integrate. Most of us don't know how to integrate. It is extremely hard to integrate. Most functions do not have a closed form antiderivative. Now, when you take Cal 2, however, we are very careful in what we give you so that they do have closed form. Differentiation is completely different. I can't give you anything that's nice involving the standard functions and adding, subtracting, multiplying composition that you can't differentiate. That doesn't mean you'll enjoy it, but I can't stump you. Integration, very easy to come up with something that doesn't have a closed form solution. We will spend a lot of time looking at named probability distributions. These are distributions that have very nice computable means and variances and integrals because we can then work with these in closed form. And if you have a flexible enough family, and we'll see lots of examples, it's okay that it doesn't exactly model the real world. It's gonna be close enough for all practical purposes. All right, so office hours. So if I'm in my office, it's office hours. I actually prefer to do walking office hours if we don't need a blackboard. I think it's you know, good exercise. We spend too much time sitting. Also now in the mask era, I think it's much nicer to be able to just be walking outdoors. I am a New Englander, so I cannot imagine a temperature when it's going to be too cold for me to be outside. You know, whatever you're comfortable with, happy to do that. The TAs will have a lot of office hours as well. We have uh, two TAs for this class. In previous years, I have had um, a Gmail account where people could just log on and send anonymous comments. I don't think that works anymore because Gmail has changed their security. And so I will try to find a way for people to give anonymous comments to me, either about you know, this class or just math stats at Williams or just things in general. If there's information you think that I should know or that there's an issue going on that you would like help me solving, just get it to me. I serve on a regional school committee and there was an issue yesterday at the school and someone did not want to be the parent who brings this forward. So they brought it to them, I'll take care of it. I, I can pass this on. And so it's always good to know how to get information like this where it is necessary. All right, so the web page is using the state-of-the-art 1990s HTML technology. Uh, it looks extremely primitive, but it is functional. And I can easily move it from school to school, from year to year. I maintain all the files. When I get an email from William saying that we're now moving to the latest version of Glow or whatever, I can just hit delete because I just maintain everything. The homework, um, I will be having you submit through Glow. This is going to be easier for the TAs to grade to give you feedback and just have everything in one place. And so they will be posting the homework assignments on Glow, and I will have them on my webpage as well. All of the videos, though, and the handouts and whatnot are going to be from my homepage. The other advantage of this is it's now freely accessible to anyone in the world. And so if you leave Williams and you want to come back and you want to look something up, it's all still there and readily available. In previous years, I've used clickers. Um, I'm going to assume right now that everybody has you know, a smartphone or some device. If not, let me know. What I might do instead is just have people go to some sheet online when we're doing stuff like that. You know, the technology has changed since I started teaching this class here 13 years ago. Um, I still remember a few years ago, my daughter wanting a cell phone. And you're saying to my wife, well, how old were you mom, when you got your cell phone? And so the technology is a little, and you know, my daughter's jaw just drops. And then my wife goes, and if you think that's bad, your know, daddy didn't get his until he was 32. So, all right. Um, the probability lifesaver, the textbook for the course, it's already been written, but there's been a lot of uh, positive feedback and a lot of people have been asking for a solution key. And so if people are interested in writing a solution key for the book, we can divide this work among the whole class. And you know, I'll happily work with you either on just a bunch of problems or all the problems or just all the problems for certain chapters um, and just you know, try to get something like that. And this is again, a nice way to see math in more detail. Depending on how much you're doing, I am happy to take points away, percentage points away from the midterms and the finals and move it to doing just more homework problems. 
you know, again, the goal is to learn probability. We are Williams College, we can be flexible and we don't have to be a one size fits all. And so if there are things that you really want to do, let's do them, especially since this is something that a lot of people I think will enjoy. It's really good to try to create your own problems. So sometimes when I teach classes and books on development, I ask students to make their own problems. It's a really good way to try to learn uh, writing things for yourself. Uh, I'm mentioning again, and it's in red, prepare for class. That's probably something very important. So I will assume everyone is prepared for class. We will discuss later exactly what that means. That's going to depend a little bit in part about how we decide to play the semester. All right. So you never know when an opportunity is going to present it itself. So my thesis advisor was fortunate. He had two graduate students named Steve Miller who were in the same year, same city. The other one, even though he's younger than I am, he's smarter, he graduated a few years before me. And they were organizing a conference for his 61st birthday. When you get old, you really want a conference in your honor. That's, that's the greatest birthday present you can get. They didn't want to have two Steve Millers as organizers. So you know, I was not insulted that I was not an organizer, but I was helping out with various things. And at the banquet, where you have a lot of the big shots in the field, there were a couple of people who were asked to just say a few words. I was not one of the people who was asked. I was not insulted. You know, there are so many people that he has worked with and whatnot. I prepared a speech just in case. And then after the people gave their set speech, they then said, you know, is there anybody else who wants to say a few words? And then they handed the mic to certain people, including myself. And so I was very glad at that moment that I had prepared something about just how much he meant to me and how much his mentoring has impacted what I did. So, you know, especially for those of you who are getting ready, you never know when you're going to have an opportunity. Impress someone. Respond to emails within a day. You know, if you're given a task, do the task well. Do better than well if possible. You know, go beyond. So you also never know who's going to be able to help you. You know, try not to burn bridges. All right. So your job, be prepared for class. Boy, that keeps popping up. So do the reading. Think about the material. And then come to me in the TAs when you have questions. And then our job is to you know, provide the resources and to be available. So my brother has three pieces of advice that he likes me to share. The first is party less than the person next to you. The next is take advantage of office hours and mentoring. As you get older, that is going to be less uh, available. And the last is to learn to manage your time. So I think I wrote in the email that you know, I will not accept extensions unless an absolute catastrophe happens if you give me less than 24 hours notice. That's just unacceptable. It has to be something completely absurd. And even then, you should have been ready. You should not be cutting things to the last minute. Uh, any Star Wars fans here? You, so I had a computer science major a few years ago who was into special effects who had never seen the original Star Wars. And so as a professor, you can do a lot of things if you keep your face you know, straight and don't laugh. And so I told her, I can actually hold up your graduation until you see Star Wars. And so I said, we're going to have a public screening. I'll, I'll bring in pizza. Halfway through, this, the DVD stops playing. And I can't get the DVD to play. What do I do? You pop in the other DVD? Yes, I pop in the other DVD that I had on me. I had a backup DVD. <laughs> and then she looked at me, well, what happened if that doesn't work? I said, then we watch it on VHS. You know, if there is one piece of technology that everything is crucially dependent on, if you can have a backup, try to. There are so many times I have seen technology fail and people have no backups. They have their slides only in one spot and then they can't access them. So my slides for this is not only online and on my computer, it's in my email. You know, I have at least three different ways I can get to my slides right now. So I really want you to learn, you know, to manage your time to be prepared to have that plan B that you know, when things go wrong, you are not in a bad shape. So if you know you have work to try to get things done well in advance so that if something happens, you're, you're okay or if you have an opportunity. Um, I sadly have had friends who have gone through crises and I've had to all of a sudden stop and be you know, very available to them. You don't know when it's going to happen. Now, if something happens, talk to me, I'm happy to work with you. Sometimes things are beyond your control. Uh, a couple of years ago, I had a student who was in probability and she was one of the vice president on college council and she'd been reelected. But this was an election when there was a controversy and they disqualified the presidential candidates and they had to do a new election. There was some shenanigans going on. 
And all of a sudden she finds herself as the acting college council president in the midst of having to run a new election after all this has happened. And so I thought, okay, this is not something you were planning on. Your homework for probability is paused whenever you want to resume doing it, everything's recorded. All right, so as much as you can prepare in advance. So again, happy to do practice interviews, happy to adjust deadlines as long as you give me some notice. All right, is this readable? Yeah. Okay, anybody read 1984? Okay, so this is the question on what is the right statistic? So this is the American League snapshot from June 4th, 2018. On the left, we have the Red Sox at 41 and 19 in first place, the Yankees 37 and 17 and one game behind. On the right, we have the Yankees 37 and 17 in first place, one game behind the Red Sox who are in second. The reason is on the left, they are ordering the teams by how far are you behind first place. On the right, they are ordering them by the winning percentage. The Yankees amazingly have a slightly better winning percentage because the Sox had played six games more and had gone four and two. Four and two is a what winning percentage? 666, both teams, 683, 685, both teams are actually doing so well that going four for a four out of six actually lowered the winning percentage. Which is the right statistic? Well, to some extent, it doesn't really matter because at the end of the year, they'll have the same number of games. If you somehow doubt me, what should you do if you think I'm making these numbers up? Go online. And if you go online and check, you will not find these numbers. And the reason you won't find these numbers is because one of the reasons the Sox had played six games more is one of the Yankee games had been rained out in the middle. When you finish a rained out game, the game, all the game statistics count for the day it was started. And the Yankees ended up losing that game. So if you go online and check, because I actually needed this for a talk I was giving this summer, if you go online and check, it no longer has this disparity. You also now have the amazing situation where uh, one of the Astros batters in the Yankee game that was rained out, he did not play the initial game, the initial part of the game, but he played the rained out continuation in August and he hit a home run. So his first major league home run happened five days before he was caught up to the major leagues. And so again, you can have some really interesting statistics. There's often some fascinating stories you can tell. It is often a really difficult question to figure out what is the right statistic. Any football fans here? Do you know what the quarterback's ranking is? QR. Yeah. What's a good QR rating? North of 100. And can you give me the formula? No. no yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> I have some idea of the inputs that go into why do we choose to weigh things by this as opposed to that? You know, I have some idea of maybe, yeah, reception should matter, touchdown should matter, you know, fumble should matter, yards should matter, but how much weight to give each one of them? And so there are some statistics that you can calculate very easily, others not so much. Uh, anybody ever hear of US News and World Report? Why does Williams have so many classes that are 19 students, like Captain 19? I, I, you can't see the smile, unfortunately. What's considered a small class by US News and World Report? I think it's under 20. So 19 or less. And so I believe that is why a lot of classes are capped at 19. So when you have you know, certain statistics, it's fascinating to see the impact that they have as they propagate through as to what decisions are being made. All right, uh, so gambling, you know, obviously I do not encourage anything that is illegal. This is merely for theoretical entertainment. All right, so in 2007, a friend of one of my favorite students bet $500 at a thousand to one odds that the Patriots would go undefeated and win the Super Bowl. <laughs> so for people who know me, what teams do I like? Patriots, Patriots yeah, Red yeah. Sox, Celtics. So one of my favorite students, not him or his friend, loves all the teams I hate. And so in honor of him, I do show this so that I have at least one moment in the class when I am, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it still hurts to see this years later. Uh, 
you know, so this is my moment of, you know, fairness and balance. Right? So the Patriots were extremely close to going undefeated and winning the Super Bowl this year. He would have had $500,000. In the third quarter with the Patriots leading, Vegas calls him and says, we're willing to buy your bet back right now at 300 to one. And his response, hell no, go back. Now, if you talked to him a little bit later, you know, he would have, of course, kicked himself. <laughs> what was his mistake? And don't say his mistake was not selling back. Yes. So you, um, <laughs> so I forgot to mention um, under the grading mechanics, the personalized final option. <laughs> now, to some extent, that's not a terrible answer because by being a Pats fan, he might be colored and he might not see what he should do. What was his mistake? And it's not that he didn't take 300 to one. He should have done something before the game started, which would be painful for Pats fans to do. Hedged. He should have hedged. He should have bet on the Giants. So imagine the Patriots have a probability P of winning. The Giants will then have a probability of one minus P. We're not going to have a game tie. So imagine for every dollar you bet on the Giants, you get back X dollars. And so what I've done is I've done, you know, here is a plot of, you know, what is his expected winnings? And so imagine uh, by hedging, he's going to bet B dollars on the Giants. Um, and we're gonna, I'm sorry. yes. And then you know, we can vary and see you know, what we're going to do. And we can actually adjust things so we can guarantee say $350,000. Which would you rather have $350,000 or 80% of the time, 500,000? So expected value is what you get on average. If 80% of the time you get $500,000, on average, how much do you get? $400,000. Wouldn't you rather have $400,000 than three hundred and fifty? dollars If I listen to the question I'm asking, yeah. would you rather have $400,000 or three hundred and fifty? dollars There's a certain level of basic algebra that I am assuming everybody has, okay? If you would rather have $350,000 dollars $400,000, we can talk later and I would gladly trade $350,000 for $400,000. You know, you're going to be a Williams graduate, I'll take an IOU. <laughs> so you would much rather have the $400,000. Why would it be better to take the $350,000 over the expected four hundred? dollars You're risk averse. The other thing is, what is the marginal benefit of going from $350,000 to $500,000? How much is that extra $150,000 worth to you? How life-changing is it? Especially when you consider that there are, what is gonna happen if you get an extra $150,000? Taxes. So of that extra $150,000, you're gonna lose at least a third. So the marginal benefit, the marginal utility of that extra $150,000 is not nearly the same as the first 350. So if you look at a utility, I would much rather have the certainty of 350,000. What if you're Jeff Bezos or someone of that ilk? Which would you rather do? The 80% of the time I'm going to get 500,000? Yeah, I mean, you, you've got so much there that you, you can play this so many times that you're fine with that. But he should have absolutely hedged. All right, here's you know, simple mathematical code to do this. You can use whatever language you want, but I want everybody to be comfortable programming in some environment by the end of this. You need to be able to write some simulations. R is, you know, not surprisingly, an extremely popular choice by people. Uh, you know, mathematically, you can have sliding functions and just you know, see how things vary. All right. Uh, in previous years, you know, we'll end with a better picture. So in previous years, uh, there have been, you know, sabermetrics clubs on campus. I've often done lawsuits involving students on campus for Major League Baseball and other organizations. If people are interested in stuff like that, let me know. Uh, you seem to be knowledgeable about football. Would you like to comment on this picture? It's not a happy day. <laughs> I'm a, a Jets fan. So. so this is the Patriots Super Bowl against the Seattle Seahawks. And the clock museum here actually had a bet with, the, with one of the museums in Seattle. Loser has to pay all expenses to send one of their really good paintings to the other for the summer. And it's, it's nice when they do something like this. So 
there was a lot of debate because the Seahawks needed a touchdown to win the game as the time was expiring. And instead of running the ball up the middle, they decided to do a passing play, which worked for them at the end of the first half. And it's a really good question as to, was this the right move mathematically? And a lot of people say it actually was, that when you do all the calculations, a lot of people do the conventional wisdom because you can't be fired for the conventional wisdom. It was a great quote, something like, you know, the, the tall grass feels the blade first. You know, if you do something that gets you noticed, if something goes wrong, it's your head on the chopping block. So a lot of people play a conservative strategy where what they're trying to do is not maximize their probability of winning, but maximize their probability of not being blamed for failure. <laughs> and as an organization, that's not necessarily what you want. Uh, you know, another football example, years ago, Bill Belichick was playing, his Patriots were playing the Indianapolis Colts, and the Patriots just needed like half a yard or a yard on fourth down to win the game and run out the clock. And this happens many times. The Patriots went for it, didn't get it. The Colts had a short field. Peyton Manning marched down and scored a touchdown and won the game. And, you know, Bill Belichick in one of his very verbose press conferences, when asked, why did you do this? I thought it gave us a better chance of winning. Next question. The computer simulation supported what he did. Most people are very afraid to go on fourth down. They don't go on fourth down nearly enough. And it's something that you really want to think about when you are pursuing strategies. What is the best strategy to pursue? All right, any question on the mechanics up till now? All right, so I will send more details about various possibilities. I want to go quickly to the hoops game. We had two. Uh, students were kind enough to volunteer to shoot. You are responsible for keeping track of how many homework exemptions you have. It's for one problem, it's not for one homework assignment. And then just use it whenever you want. And just when you're writing up your homework, you say, I'm using my exemption for this. All right. Does everybody here remember the geometric series formula? One plus R plus R squared plus R cubed. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a way to prove the geometric series formula by playing a game of hoops. And this is a formula that we're going to use a lot in probability. I want to do this because one, it emphasizes really good ways to look at problems. And that's one of the big things going on in the semester is it's so hard to know how to look at things properly. So I'm going to see if I can stop the share for a second and just switch to video. So I am a huge fan of Rubik's cubes. This is a standard Rubik's cube. How many sides does it have? Is it pretty easy to see which is the red side? You know, this is not really surprising. I have a bunch of strange shaped cubes here. You know, this is, I, I like to call it the nunchuck cube. If I twist it a little bit, I can convert it into a star. You, know, you can do a lot more strange things with it. This does not look like a standard Rubik's cube. You know, this side, I have six, I have nine pieces, but they're in a strange shape. On these sides, I only have six. If you try to turn the red side, it doesn't turn. The two cubes are almost identical. The only difference between this and the standard cube is if I put pictures on the standard cube, so the orientation of the centers mattered, they would be completely the same. You have to know how to look at this properly. And the correct way to look at this is at a 30 degree angle. If you look at it at 30 degrees, this is now, the, is now one of the sides, it's the front side. It's actually split between red and green, and now you see your nine pieces. So much of algebra is about looking at things the right way. You know, this is a wave cube where you have two sides blue, two sides white, two sides red. It's really the same as that with a little bit of a twist. You've got to be careful, but it's essentially the same. This one over here, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. This one has 16 sides. Does it seem impressive to you to do a 16-sided cube? You know, oh, you do six-sided cubes. Oh, that, that's, that's not bad for you know, someone your age. This is actually the same as a two-by-two two cube, but it's done in such a way that it looks much more impressive. And so why am I showing Rubik's Cube? Why am I bringing basketball nets? Well, now I can justify using research forms for them. Uh, the, re the reason is because it illustrates the key point. So much of math is about doing algebra. It's actually one of the most important classes you have in your school. And people often just pushed through it before they have a solid grasp of how to do algebra. How do you take expressions and rewrite them in such a way that you can see what the hell is going on? 
There's a great story that when Kepler was coming up with his laws of planetary motion, he was working on Mars and he had the equation for the orbit of Mars. He goes, damn it, if only it was an ellipse. But unfortunately, I have the following. It actually was an ellipse. It was just written in a different form than he knew and he didn't recognize that it was the equation of an ellipse. So, so much of what is going on is trying to figure out how can you look at things properly? And that's why I am trying you know, so hard to emphasize concepts like this. All right, so does anybody know who these two players are? Magic Johnson and Larry Bird. And the reason I am using Larry Bird and Magic Johnson is because I'm old. You know, when I was young, there were three teams in basketball, Celtics, Lakers, and 76ers. Celtics played the Lake, I'm sorry, played the 76ers, winners played the Lakers. So we're gonna play a modified basketball game. And the way it works is very similar to the game we had in class before things began. Bird and Magic alternate shooting because I'm from Boston, Bird gets to go first. Bird will always get a basket with probability Q. Magic will always get a basket with probability Q. If you want, you could do a little bit better notation. You could use P sub B for Bird and P sub M for Magic. It's worth taking time to think about what notation you want so you can quickly look down and see what goes on. Frequently, we use Q for one minus P here or not. Just like when you're doing calculus, if I give you little f, what is its antiderivative? Big F. And that way, we've just done this as a convention, so we know that there's an association between them. So let's let X be the probability bird wins. What is X? So one of the main themes in probability is we break things into cases. And if the cases are mutually exclusive, and exhaustive, if they cover all the possibilities, then if we just sum what happens in each one, we know what goes on. What is the probability Bird wins on his first shot? P. What is the probability Bird wins on his second shot? Almost. It's not one minus P times P, it's close to that. It's one minus P times, times one minus Q times p, you know, magic has to miss, right? You know, we are at least gonna let magic shoot. What is the probability bird wins on his third shot? One minus p, one minus q, squared, yep. And so on the nth shot, you would just have this pairing n times. Well, let's let r be one minus p, one minus q. So the probability bird wins is p on the first shot, plus rp on his second shot, plus r squared p on his third shot, and so on and so on. And so if we sum them all together, we get the geometric series. And so the probability bird wins is p times the geometric series. If we knew the geometric series, we would be done. Let's assume we don't know the geometric series. We don't know the formula for this. Okay, so you don't know that it's one over one minus r. Let's try to solve this without the geometric series. And again, this is the whole point of the Rubik's cube of trying to find another way to look at the algebra. Let's calculate X another way. So a tremendous amount of mathematics is about doing the same problem two different ways and then saying, ah, the way that I can't do must equal the way I can do. And so you find an equivalent formulation. Let's calculate the probability Bird wins. So Bird could win on his first basket. You know, he could shoot, score, and the game is over or bird could miss and magic could miss. So imagine we're in the situation that bird and magic both miss. What is the probability from this point onward that bird wins the game? So what is it? It's on the board. What is the probability bird wins from this point on? It is so they both missed from this point onward. What is the probability of both wins? It's it's what? It's X, right? X is the probability bird wins when bird starts with the ball. If they both missed, it's like we've just reset the game. Does the first shot matter? No, because they don't tie. So it's just X. We now go from having an infinite sum to having a finite sum. So 
So for those of you who remember the standard proof of the geometric series formula, you know, you multiply by R, you subtract, you have a telescoping sum, you do it with a finite sum, and then you take a limit. We bypass all of that. We're using a memoryless process. This is a wonderful idea. And so it's just X equals P plus RX. Oh, well, this is just basic algebra. So when we solve, we get X is equal to P over one minus R. And now we've proven the geometric series formula. Is this as good of a proof as the original? So for the geometric series formula, what are the conditions on the geometric series formula? If you want to use the geometric series formula, what must be true? Okay, so if, if you are real focused, R, the absolute value of R has to be less than one. You could allow R to be complex, but you, you, you want the absolute value of R to be less than one. In this proof, what is true about R? If we're doing a calculation, what can you tell me is true about R? It could be, well, it could be one. If R is one, then P and Q would both be zero, which means bird and magic have no chance of making the basket, which means it's gonna be a long game. What kind of number is one minus P, one minus Q? P and Q are probabilities. So where does P live as a probability between what? Zero, zero and one. Q is between zero and one. So what must be true about one minus P, one minus Q? It's between zero and one. So this is not a proof for all R. This is only a proof for R between zero and from zero to one. So this proof in some sense is not quite as good as the other. As an extra credit problem, take the geometric series formula, assume you know it when R is positive and prove that you can get it immediately from R negative. So we can actually modify if we know this for positive R and get it for negative R. Years ago, my brother and one of his friends were playing a baseball game where you could create your own character and they went opposite routes. One of them created the ultimate pitcher who struck everybody out. The other created the ultimate hitter who always got a home run and they faced off. And the old apple just paused for several minutes trying to figure out what to do with a batter who always hits a home run and a pitcher who always strikes everybody out. And then amazingly, the computer outputted an answer. And if you think about it, it's actually a reasonable answer. Anybody want to guess what the computer said the batter did? No, but that's not bad. Double. Home run is four bases, out is zero. Let's split the difference, we'll call it. You always want to ask, well, what would happen if I did something strange like you know, P and Q are both zero? Well, if P and Q are both zero, then X, if P and Q are both zero, what is R equal? One. So the denominator would be zero, but the numerator would also be zero. We have zero over zero. So at least the formula is telling us, look, I'm making no claim as to what's gonna happen when both suck. So you always wanna ask, is this formula reasonable? What kind of test can you do? Well, if neither one of them can hit a basket to save their life, you know, the game should not end. We get zero over zero. So that's a good indication that something is happening. All right, so you know, there's a lot of lessons we can learn from the proof problem. Uh, the first is you know, this idea of a memoryless process. That for a lot of things in life, it doesn't matter how you got there, it only matters where you are. In Monopoly, does it matter what configure, you know, how you got to a given configuration? Or just if I tell you who has how much money, who has which properties, where the pieces are, how developed things are, is that all that I need to know? Monopoly is memories. What about chess? Does it matter how who plays chess? Does it matter how you got to a board configuration? Why? Well, no, but if, I mean, if you had a legal configuration, does it matter how you got there? There are rules in chess about a draw. If you have a threefold repetition of, of positioning, then the game is automatically a draw. This is to prevent some people from just purposely cycling for all eternity. It makes the game terminate. And so for chess, it actually does have a small dependence. 
for all practical purposes, it's memoryless for most of us when we play, we're really not at that level. You can circumvent some difficult algebra if you look at problems the right way. And again, it is very hard to do this. The more problems you do, the more experience you get. This is one of the reasons why if people wanna just write up lots of solutions to problems and do less on exams, I'm happy to do that because there is a tremendous value to just doing lots of problems. The more problems you do, the more things you see, the easier it is for you to then, ah, this reminds me of blank because you've seen so many things, it's gonna remind you of something. The depth of a problem is not always what we would expect. You have this infinite sum and you have to say, oh my God, how am I gonna handle an infinite sum? We were actually able to rewrite it and make it uh, just a simple finite sum. All right, so we have, you're on the order of your three or four, wait a minute. You have about three or four minutes left. I don't want to go too long on the first day. So I'm going to just you know, pause here and see if there are any other questions. Okay, so the way my schedule is, this is the first time in my Williams career where I am actually not teaching back to back. I haven't decided yet if I'm happy or unhappy about this, but it is never going to be a bad time to talk to me after class because I'm not going to be running anywhere. I will stop here if anybody wants to chat about anything, happy to chat.